it's just talking to people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's it's conversations. You know, and I'm good at that. You know, I have a natural gift from God to be able to communicate with people and relate to people. Um, and I learned so much from talking to people. The best thing that I ever learned in life is if you listen more than you speak, you'll always be able to understand somebody. And one thing that I learned is that we are much more alike than we are different. We just make that more complicated. Welcome everybody to the Live Your Purpose Podcast. I'm your host, John Morgan Jr. We have a very, very special, special guest um, with us today. Um, but before I get into the intro of who we have and, you know, sharing sharing her story and, you know, kind of getting to, you know, how we do. Of course, I'm going to do a little bit of back backstory again of why I started the podcast. Um, not just for our guests, but for, for everybody, you know. Um, again, the name of the podcast is called the Live Your Purpose Podcast. And that's very much self-explanatory um, for me and just the stage that I'm in in life um, as far as just age-wise, developmental, everything. I feel like I am doing everything with, um, well, it is, I'm doing everything with intention. I'm trying to live my life with as much intention and purpose as possible. And my number one way of doing that is doing things to step outside of myself to be able to serve people. Um, and that was one of the one of the main reasons why I started this podcast was to be able to serve my guests, serve the audience, um, and just be able to highlight people's stories who whom I respect, who I love, who I care about, who I respect, and who I believe has just as much cachet and importance as any celebrity or anybody out there in the world. So um, with that being said, without further ado, we're going to go and get into our our guest. Um, we have Dr. Tania Lodge. I'm going to go over a little bit of her bio with y'all so y'all can just understand how important um, she is. So Dr. Tania Lodge is a clinical director of Minority Behavioral Health Group, a community mental health agency um, located right here in Akron. She specializes in providing cultural specific uh, health services, including mental health assessment, psychotherapy, professional development workshops, and continuing education trainings on cultural competency and culturally appropriate services. She received her PhD in clinical psychology. She holds two master degrees in marriage and family therapy and clinical psychology. Her clinical and research projects interests include program evaluation and development, treatment outcomes, culturally assessments and treatment, African-centered psychology and psychotherapy process and interpersonal trauma, racial trauma, infant mortality, and psychological oppression. Dr. T, welcome. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. That is a hell of an intro. It is. It, it is. Can you, <laughs> Thank you. How, how, do you, how do you feel when you, when you hear that intro? Does that ever like, is it ever overwhelming to hear all those things? It is overwhelming. Is it? It is. Why? I say to myself, I'm doing all of that. Yeah. It's surreal. Yeah. But yeah. I am happy and blessed to be able to um, do it. But when I hear it, it's it's interesting because you don't really think about it or reflect on it when you're just doing it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. yeah when yeah, people yeah. read my bio, it's just like, oh, okay. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's a it's that's a that's a beautiful thing. When I was going over it, I'm like, damn. I'm like, this this is a lot, but I'm like, it's very very cool. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? To be able to have this and you know be able to have a relationship with you and to know who you are. That yeah, we see we hear the bio, we hear all the degrees and everything like that but mm -hmm. to know the person underneath all of this makes it you know that much more yes. appreciative um so thank you for joining us today thanks for I, having me no problem no problem um so before we really get into you know a lot of things i know we want to touch on um i want to touch on the beginning how did dr tania like where did i know you grew up in cleveland mm -hmm. um but what was it like for Dr. for Tania Lodge early on in those years, what was it like for you growing up in Cleveland, a young girl? How did that young girl become the lady who we just read over in this bio? Yes. Um, life experiences. So I will mm -hmm. say that I did grow up in Cleveland the earlier years of my life um, from birth to about fifth grade, I grew up inner city Cleveland, right off St. Clair. Mm -hmm. um, very chaotic um, neighborhood and environment surrounded by violence and drugs and things, unfortunately, that we often see in the African American community. Um, my mom raised me with uh, my stepfather at the time, 
and I am the middle child of four, so I'm the second oldest. I have an um, older sister who's just one year older than I am. Mm. Um, we're very close in age. Most people thought that we were twins for a long time until um, we reached adolescence. But I have her, and then I have a younger brother who's four years older than I. So during those years, it was just us. And my mom gave birth to a baby boy when I was nine years old. And unfortunately, um, he died. It's an infant mortality case. Mm -hmm. He died before he reached one. And... Um, at that time, my mom had a lawsuit in which she sued the hospital and the visiting nurse. And we moved to Cleveland Heights, which is a suburb um, in Cleveland. And so the latter half of my youth was um, in Cleveland Heights, which was a very different experience. Growing up inner city Cleveland, going to Cleveland public schools versus suburban schools in Cleveland Heights. Really? Wow. Yeah, that, that is a... That's a definitely culture, culture shock, you know, mm -hmm. going from the city and going to the suburbs. I'm sure that... What grade were you in when you went to Cleveland Heights? Um, fifth grade. Fifth grade. Okay, mm -hmm. so you just starting to like notice the world a little bit different in fifth grade. Still don't know anything. You're still a child, but you notice like, okay, I know what I like a little bit. I have my interests and hobbies and whatnot. So I'm sure that when you got to Cleveland Heights, yeah. coming from the city, you like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is this is totally different than where I'm coming from. Absolutely. Did you and have a hard time like making friends and or did you? I mean, I'm sure you had you had your siblings and stuff. So it was it an easy transition for you? Um, peer wise, I would say yes. But when I reflect on it, so when I was going to Cleveland Public Schools, I was into the arts. Mm -hmm. I was a dancer, mm -hmm. and that was my passion, and that's what I did. Um, and unfortunately, in third grade, I missed my dance audition mm. for the Cleveland School of Arts. And so that was devastating because I think my path would have been very different had I taken that path. If you would have stuck with dance. Yes. Okay. So that's my first love. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so when I got to Cleveland Heights, here's what I remember. It was trying to fit into the environment. So it was very clear that there um, was racism happening. And I think that's when I became a racism, moving from a predominantly black neighborhood, black school district, going into a predominantly white. And so my mother and my stepfather, um, they didn't complete high school. So their education stops at like 10th and 11th grade. And so that was very critical because, and my mother worked full time. So my stepfather was like responsible for getting me off to school and, you know, coming to my games and things like that. And I remember the first day of school, he took me and I had to meet with the guidance counselors. And I remember him saying to the guidance counselor, like, oh, she's a straight A student. Um, she's always having these accolades. This is who she is. And I remember the white guidance counselor looked at him and said, oh, well, not here. Mm. And she is going to start not in the basic classes, but the remedial classes. Mm. And I remember, you know, when that happened and I can't, I mean, I didn't think much of it, but I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember the lady was, she was wearing what I had on and what my stepfather had on. And I'm also aware that at the time he was not able to articulate or call it what it was. Yeah. So we just went with it. Mm -hmm. And so I remember being in classes with people um, that were considered like below average, mm -hmm. which of course um, messed with my, you know, confidence. It messed with my confidence. Mm -hmm. So then I wasn't performing. Mm -hmm. I think that's when I got my first C and D. Mm -hmm. And my family was like, what is going on? A lot was attributed to the loss of my brother mm -hmm. um, or the change in the environment, but no. So out the gate, I was already um, pinpointed and, and placed into a classroom that was well below my abilities. And so it took me a minute to kind of adjust. So in the environment, that was difficult, like navigating the classes and the teachers um, in the district. But in terms of peers and friends, um, it was very easy for me to, to do that. Yeah. So when you say that your, your, you notice your grades dropping and things like that, now mm -hmm. do you attribute that to more so because you just spoke on it, the loss of your brother and kind of like the stuff that you were dealing with internally, you said your confidence, mm -hmm. you know, it dropped a little bit or was it more so the, the environment? Like, was it, which one of them do you think it was that kind of attributed to your, 
your performance kind of dropping. Absolutely. So when I reflect back on it, knowing uh-huh. what I know now, I would attribute it to um, the racism and the oppression that that was happening. Yeah. Back then, when I'm listening to the adults, and I don't really have the cognitive flexibility to even understand what happened, I was taking on, oh, okay, it's because of what happened to my brother, which is a very traumatic story. And so I'll share it with you because it, it kind of puts things into perspective. Mm-hmm. My brother was born premature, and so when he came home, he had to have a nurse come out with him. Now, I have always been this kind of, you know, observant individual. I always pay attention. Um, I was always, like, doing homework. I was always doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so my mom, she would bowl, like, four nights a week. Mm -hmm. Or when she would go to work, the nurse would be at the home, and then my sister and I and younger brother uh, would be at the home with the nurse. So I would watch the nurse with the baby. I would always pay attention. He had a trachea in his um, neck because he couldn't breathe on his own. So once a week, you would have to change the trach. Where And if you didn't change it appropriately, he would suffocate. And unfortunately, that's what happened. Mm. So I remember on a Sunday evening, my mother came home, and I said to her, I said, Mom, um, I don't think the nurse, he got a new nurse. And so the old nurse was training the new nurse. And I remember her saying to um, the nurse, she was like, well, what is this? And I was thinking to myself, like, how you don't know that? How do you not know what <laughs> right. this is? Right. And the lady was trying to tell her. And in fact, she told her, don't worry about it. You know, just kind of suction it out if he sound like he has mucus in him or whatnot. So when my mom came home that evening, I said to her, I was like, mom, you know, I don't think the nurse really know what the trach is or how to change it. Now, I'm nine at the time. And my mom, I can't really remember her response, but I would say she blew me off. And then the next day, um, I go to school. It's a Monday. I go to school. And we come home. My sister and I, we come home, and the house is empty. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you. My brother should be there with the nurse. Mm-hmm. So the house is empty. And so we're at home and we're just waiting. My grandfather at the time, he comes and picks my sister and I up and say, we got to go to the hospital because something happened to Boo. And so we get to the hospital um, and they tell me what happened. So the lady tried to change the trach and didn't know how to put it back in. And so he suffocated. Um, and I remember just sitting in a lobby, the whole family was in a lobby, and I looked at my mom and I said, I told you, like I told you she didn't know what to do. Yeah. And I remember my family saying, oh no, don't say that, and you know, my mom was crying and upset, and so I said, okay. So then they take us back there to see him, and I can see him right now as I look at you, mm. the most devastating wow. thing that I've experienced in my entire existence. Um, and so for me, it was it was traumatic, even the um, the funeral and just I mean, all of it was traumatic, but I was aware of it. So even though we stayed in Cleveland public schools, my grades didn't fall then. Right. So I had my grades fail immediately after that because it took like a year and a half for my mom to get the lawsuit and for us to move to Cleveland Heights. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't this automatic thing. Mm-hmm. So I was still able to function to a certain degree as I was doing. Yeah. So. I, I don't think that I would say that it was that, although yeah. that's what, you know, my mom and some of the teachers were trying to attribute it to. And so she ended up winning the lawsuit, sounds like. Oh, yes. She won um, lawsuits, which is um, what paid for my college tuition. Yeah. She made sure she set up trust funds for the other three of us. Um, and the only way we were able to get it is if we graduated high school and went to college. Um and I was the only one who was able to um, benefit from that. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, she won. She bought a house in Cleveland Heights. So we moved. It was a big culture shock for all of us. Um, yeah. And so that's what happened. And so how old was your brother? Was He, he didn't make a year yet? He, did, he was, his birthday was in October and he died in March. Wow. So, yeah, it's about almost six months almost. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so do you remember seeing, because obviously it was traumatic for you. Do you remember seeing, like, your family dynamics kind of change? Do you remember seeing the impact of, like, how it affected your mother, your stepfather, and, you know, your grandparents? Do you remember seeing Mm -hmm. what that did? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. They um, divorced. Yeah. They ended up getting a divorce. Yeah. Um, After that, I remember my mom... um, 
got her tubes tied where she was not able to have kids anymore. Um, that became problematic. So after she had him, she got her tubes tied, but then she lost them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was a big stress on a marriage amongst other things, but absolutely they fell apart. Um, they fell apart after that. So sixth grade is when we got to Cleveland Heights. I was going into the sixth grade and then they were divorced by ninth, my ninth grade year. Mm. So th- maybe three years later, they were done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm just now um, getting a little bit educated on infant mortality, and I still have a long way to go. Mm-hmm. But can you explain, you know, to people what exactly infant mortality is, and specifically how it affects Black people, and you know how it's connected to oppression? Absolutely. Um, so infant mortality basically is about babies who do not make it to their first birthday. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times it's attributed to premature birth or low birth weight. So when mothers are either, you know, taking in toxicity, whether it's drugs, alcohol, um, stress, chronic stress is Mm -hmm. something that's often overlooked. But when you look at the infant mortality rate across the country and specifically in Summit County, the rate is much higher for African-American babies. And so African-American babies are dying at a higher rate than white babies. And so we are attempting to figure out why. Um, There's a lot of research um, and funding that's being thrown around to kind of support the African-American community, but the real issue isn't being addressed. Mm -hmm. And so when I am consulted or asked to speak about it, I always talk about how Racism and oppression is at the core root of why we see the difference. And I know that both professionally and personally. So when I talk about personally, outside of my mom's experience, but I also had my own experience with delivering a baby prematurely. Um, My oldest son, who is now 16, he was born at 26 weeks, 2 pounds, 8 ounces. Um, And I remember... When I went into premature labor, the doctors would come in and they would always talk about, oh, are you having a boy or a girl? Oh, she's having a boy. Oh, well, your baby, your baby's going to have a higher chance of surviving because you're having a black baby. And at the time, I, I was offended. I thought I was offended, but I didn't really understand. Like each time a new resident or a doctor would come into the room and they were holding me for like a week. I was in the hospital for a week. They were trying to stop the labor. And how, how old were you at this time? I was 26. And you were in school at this time? I was in my master's program. Okay. Um, Sean, his, his name is Sean. What happened is, is um, each time a doctor would come into the Um, room, they will always look at me, oh, she's a black woman, oh, she's having a black boy, black boys survive, black girls survive at a higher rate, but black boys survive. And so it was a strength, and it was positive that he was coming early, but he was black, because he was going to have a higher rate of of survival. So I, I gave birth to him, and he immediately had to be taken to Children's Hospital. So the first few days, I was still in the hospital, and he had to be transported to Akron Children's. So I remember going to Akron Children's for the first day, and I walked in, and I was absolutely horrified. Babies were dying mm. every day, mm-hmm. every day. So mm-hmm. each day I walked in there, I was just And they put bawling. you in there to think that you... You're in there. And you're going to be optimistic about, <laughs> about I your, mean, your child babies, surviving and they dying every they're, day. They're dying every day. I was absolutely horrified. Mm-hmm. So I would come back. The baby is gone. One time I was in there, a baby is in duress, and they're trying to... I mean, it was an absolute nightmare. Those babies were white babies. And so, again... I don't know. I didn't know then what I know now. So in reflection, I'm thinking, and my son was thriving. There was nothing wrong with him. He did not have any, you know, physical ailments or any major medical conditions going on. He was just early and he needed to, you know, get older and get closer to his gestational age before they let him come home. And so he did very well um, in the NICU. Here's the other thing that I thought was interesting when I was leaving the NICU with him. The psych nurse handed me some papers for Social Security, and she looked at me and she said, make sure you fill this out because your son has an 80% chance of being developmentally delayed. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so, 
And she wrote it on the application, like 80% MRDD actually is what she said. And so she wanted to make sure I had resources to apply for um, Social Security at that time. Mm. So my point is, when we talk about infant Uh mortality and something I like to point out, even when um, doctors and psychologists and public health officials are trying to figure out why black babies are dying at a higher rate, this is what I say to them. The medical research tells us that when babies are born prematurely, that they survive at a higher rate. That's what the medical research tells us. The research also tells us when they go home, white babies are surviving at a higher rate, right? Which means it's not biological. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although they try to put biological interventions in place, it's not biological. It's environmental. And when you think about the African-American experience, it consists of oppression and racism overtly and covertly on a regular basis. Mm. That's what's being missed. That's Mm. the only explanation as to why black babies survive when they're in a hospital, but they die at a higher rate in the community. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That is that is crazy. So when you again you said it. You alluded, said it a few times. You didn't know what you know now back then. When you mm-hmm. look back at your own experience, are you able to pinpoint what you were going to at that time that may have caused you to have an early, you know, early delivery at that time? Were you were you stressed out? Was it just a lot of stuff just going on? Was it were you not taking care of yourself yeah. that you that you thought you probably should have? What was going on that you think attributed to? I was. <laughs> what part? What portions of oppression were really affecting you? You know, at at that time, you know, that caused you to have, you know, an early, early pregnancy or early delivery. So what was going on in my life at that time? I was working full time for Cuyahoga County Department of Children and Family Services. Um, My work there, I was investigating cases of child abuse and neglect. So you're being traumatized every day. (laughs) I had nightmares the first six months that I was working there. Now, Mm -hmm. you know, I had my own experiences, Mm -hmm. but that's my lens. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what other families were dealing with outside of my own life experiences. So I was exposed to a lot at that time. Um, The abuse and neglect that was happening, the disparities as it relates to what the um, black kids were getting versus what the white kids were getting. I was in court testifying on a regular basis. So not only am I horrified by the experiences that black folks were having, I'm also horrified by how they were being treated and the disparities with the services um, that were happening. So that played a significant role. I was also in grad school at the time. a lot of racism that was taking place in my um, graduate program um, in terms of like papers and resources. So I remember trying to navigate full, a full-time job where I'm just exposed to a lot of stress. Um, I'm very aware of oppression and how it's playing out and I'm trying to resist and, and play my role in that. Um, and I'm also aware of the my own experiences by, while being in graduate school. Mm-hmm. Can you touch on a little bit of uh, the racism that you was experiencing in grad school? Because I think a lot of times, especially, you know, especially for myself being a millennial, like coming up in a generation that we're listening, going to college was everything. No mm-hmm. matter what happened, whether I went for free, what, no matter if I went for sports, anything, you got to go to high school and graduate, but going to college was everything. And I don't right. think people really always take into account. Obviously, people know that racism exists, but I don't think people connect higher education with that same type of experience. So can you speak to like some of the racism that you was experiencing yeah. when you when you were in school? Yeah. So when I was working on my first master's degree, I remember this um, incident and I had this one professor who was over the department. She was very racist. And I remember we had to write a paper and it was, I can't even remember what the paper was on, but when she gave me the paper back, I had like maybe a 98% or something. It was an A. And then you can see she erased it and gave me like a very low B, like an 82%. And I'm very OCD about my grades. Mm -hmm. And so of course, you know, I go to office hours and I say to her, like, I'm concerned about why do I have this grade? And I'm very clear that I had this grade and then you erased it. And her response to me was, well, after I read everybody's paper, 
um, I thought you should get a lower grade. Mm. So <laughs> it was absolutely awful. So that stands out for me in that um, regard. I went on to get another master's degree and my doctorate degree. Um, and again, my focus being on the African-American community and, and what psychological distress looked like specifically for African-Americans. My research and my um, clinical work was based on that. And the first time that I went through my comps presenting this motto, they failed me and they told me I had to do it again. Mm. And so I was living. In fact, what I was told is that I need to go and find a white person <laughs> because they will give you rich data. Mm. Like I was told that I was not going to pass using an African-American female. I had to go and find a white female and use a theory of their choosing on her because black people couldn't give me rich, valid data. So not only are they like killing the credibility, they're trying mm -hmm. to like discourage you so you really for real will just quit and say, man, I can't do this. Absolutely. I'm out. They were like, just take another year. Take another year. Which is now, more I money. had a plan. More Which money that I don't have. Right. 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 Um, you want me to go work with white people, right? right? That's right. not what I want to do. Right. And so it was a lot. It was a lot. So I want to go back a little bit because, again, in doing these, I always do a little bit of research and I talk to people, you know, who are closest to some of my guests. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I learned about you is, was that you really had your sights on being an attorney. Um, prior, you know, to being in the mental, mental health space. That's right. So what happened along the lines, like, what shifted from you being an attorney to being, you know, in this space and mental health and, you know, everything? Like, what changed the trajectory of that? Because I'm sure you wanted to be an attorney after you graduated high school, even going into college. So what, Absolutely. So what changed, what changed that? Because those are two, <laughs> those are two totally different career paths. Yes. So... Yes, throughout throughout high school, um, I was exposed to an African American female teacher who was teaching all the pre law classes, mm -hmm. um, and she was my mentor, mm -hmm. and she was everything to me. Like she was phenomenal, um, and she's now a judge in Cleveland. And so I remember um, taking her classes and being highly interested, and then I became a part of the mock team trials. So we were doing mock trials, and it it just it was. It just fits. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I set off to college, um, majoring in political science and sociology because I was going to law school. Mm -hmm. And so I finished, and I ended up going to get a ma – I got a job, and I went to get a master's degree first because I didn't finish um, strong enough, in my opinion, to apply to law school at that time. Mm. So when I'm speaking to mentors, they're saying, oh, get your master's degree first and then go to law school. Mm -hmm. And so I went ahead and I went to um, grad school and I was um, studying marriage and family therapy. And then I was also working in Cleveland at Cuyahoga County. Now I'm, I'm connected to the courts and I'm working closely with attorneys. And at this point, so I'm getting a, a, a front row seat on the process. Yeah. And... At that time, I would say that I was more encouraged. Like, yes, you got to get here. You got to get here. You got to get here. To be an attorney. To be an attorney. Mm -hmm. After I had my son, um, I ended up moving to Stark County, and I was working for the courts. And when I'm working for the courts, again, I'm working closely with judges. And during that time, um, what I was doing is I was evaluating kids to determine if they should be on probation, um, if they should have some kind of community control, or if they should go to prison, or some kind of treatment program. Like, this was my job. Mm -hmm. Here's what I became keenly aware of. The black kids were being diagnosed with conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder, and they were going straight to prison. Mm -hmm. I'm going to prison to visit. Mm -hmm. The white kids were being given things like depression and anxiety, which means they are getting rehabilitated. So they're going to the local mental health agencies to receive services. So I'm aware of this. And so at the time, I decided that I was going to go ahead and apply to law school. 
um, and I was also going to go and apply for um, for graduate school to get my PhD because I'm reading psych reports. So I'm all involved into the whole psych process where I'm contributing and I'm reading these psych reports where it's clearly racism and oppression happening um, with the black kids. And so this is what happened. And so I put it on the universe in God's hand. I said, Lord, this is what's going to happen. I'm applying to law school and I'm going to apply for my doctorate. Whatever happens, that's what I'm going to do. You know what happened? Whatever. I got accepted into both. To both? <laughs> you had to make the choice. <laughs> so I had to make the choice. So I'm, I had to make the choice. And because of my life experiences and work experiences at the time, I decided on psychology because I thought I could make a bigger impact um, helping to understand the psychology and the things that were happening in the African-American community. I don't want to be behind the table arguing against the law. I want to be on the stand educating on the impact yeah. and, and how things are presenting, yeah. which I think um, makes a bigger impact. Yeah, because yeah. if, if you can give the appropriate diagnosis to the judge, to the attorney, then you are then educating them on, all right, this diagnosis fits in this person. So that way, when they come across this one, for the next person that comes across, they'll be a little bit more educated that they can be, That's right. hopefully, that's Hopefully right. They, can they be a have bit more. no clue. And currently what I do is when I'm doing psyche vows and competency vows for the court, so I was able to bridge it, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. um, doing forensic psych allows me to tap into what's going on within the court in the legal system as well as in psychology. And they don't they don't have a clue. So they depend on psychologists to educate on mental health diagnosis, treatment, what's rehabilitation, what is not. Mm -hmm. And so being able to do that, I think, is a nice fit yeah. and niche. And so I was able to kind of bridge the two together. But that's how it changed. Do you ever look back and wish you would have stuck with being an attorney ever? No. Never? Mm -mm. Really? Mm -hmm. that, is, that is crazy that you got accepted, that you hit both of them. Mm-hmm. And that you ended up, because again, this is two times you talk about being a dancer first. Yes. And then when something, uh -huh. life happens mm -hmm. to where you ended up going down somewhere else, but it ultimately ends up, mm -hmm. ends up fitting um, yeah. to, to, to where you are now. Um, mental health. I feel like, I feel like today mental health is kind of like a buzzword. Mm -hmm. It's kind of being... It's it's too it's it's like a double edged sword almost. On one accord, I feel like a lot of people are being educated. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people are being um awakened, you know, so to speak, to, you know, to the importance of it, especially black people, black men specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, I can just speak to my own experience over the last couple of years. Um I never really knew what mental health really was, you mm -hmm. know, before I came to MBHG. And really the training at MBHG is what really got me to understanding the significance of mental health and how it affects black people. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the other end, when I hear people talk about mental health, I hear them talk about it, but I don't think they really, really understand mm -hmm. um, mental health and how it, what it looks like, how it affects people, um, how it shows up, what mm -hmm. the symptoms look like, how common it is, mm -hmm. um, how severe and significant even small symptoms may be, you know, like anxiety, for example. Mm -hmm. I heard people talking about that a lot, but mm -hmm. I don't know if they really understand mm -hmm. how anxiety can, like how it really shows up. Mm -hmm. What are things that make people anxious, you know, mm -hmm. especially for black people. Right. I think when I really look at it mm -hmm. and I really, really look at it and I'm just being like technical and mm -hmm. I'm just being pessimistic sometimes for mm -hmm. real. I'm like, everybody I know mm -hmm. Maybe not have severe diagnosis, but everybody I know has some form of mental health impact somewhere, somehow. That's right. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if people really, really understand that. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of speak to like the 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 severity of you know how mental health kind of really plays into you know people's experience and like how how much it does and like how many people that you may think you know really are walking around with some mental health you yeah. know. Um, not just symptoms and, you know, severe diagnosis, but how common and prevalent is mental health? Like how yeah. many people really are struggling with this? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think it's, it's very prevalent um, and pronounced 
in our communities and because of the stigma we are and because of you know some cultural dynamics we are less likely to either acknowledge recognize or even seek help Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's a reason behind that also Mm -hmm. what i will say is when you think about the climate of the country Mm -hmm. and when you think about um, our history and generational trauma when you think about our community and the impact of poverty, it's what the majority of us are experiencing. And what we rarely want to talk about or understand is the psychological impact of it. But mm-hmm. there's a psychological impact of everything that we right. encounter. Right. Everything. Right. Right. Every relationship, every interaction, every job, career, every decision that we make, there's a psychological impact. And we are just not trained or socialized to think from that perspective. Right, right. And so what ends up happening is we internalize these experiences. And yes, it manifests into depression and anxiety. And if it goes untreated, it can manifest into something more severe. Um, it's a big deal. Yeah. It's a big deal. It's yeah. something that we often should talk about. I think it's more important to talk about mental health and mental wellness more than medical health and mm. medical wellness. Mm-hmm. What is the what does the research say about black people going to therapy and why they may not last and, and why why that is? Black people do not go to therapy because there's a cultural mistrust. Um, we don't trust providers who are not black and mm-hmm. sometimes um, we don't trust providers who are black mm-hmm. given um, whether or not they understand the cultural experiences or the experiences that we have from a cultural context so we don't have culturally competent providers mm-hmm. so what ends up happening is we go to therapy after the second or third session we terminate prematurely um, we are often over pathologized, misdiagnosed with things um, that have implications as it relates to if we can get housing or a job um, or if we end up in the legal system. Um, we get less preferred treatment, and so we get often medicated and if we don't want to take medication then we are labeled as resistant Mm -hmm. and so that has its own domino effect in terms of you know resources and and things like that so in the mental health field we are often trained to use theories and therapies that are for white people Mm -hmm. they were developed for white middle class upper males and by them and by them Mm -hmm. and so And there's a movement of the evidence-based practice that if you don't use this, then you're not receiving effective treatment. But those treatment regimens are the reasons that African-Americans are less likely to engage in therapy. And when they do, they terminate prematurely or they are getting diagnosed with things that are not fitting and then they receive less preferred treatment. Can you speak to to the... the, um the wrong diagnosis being given um, because I think that that's like super important. Like I'm sure some people's experiences, they've gone to therapy and they've gotten these severe diagnosis um, where for black people, our experience doesn't always play into, you know, having these severe diagnosis. You know, we may need something much lesser, but going to the wrong provider who doesn't share our same type of experience. That's right. um, They overdiagnose. So can you speak to like some examples on what those, um, Overdiagnosis are typically what are some typical um, overdiagnoses that are usually had? Absolutely, and this is not only um, research based and highly um, documented, well documented in the literature, but it's also what we see in our clinic. And so, African American men in particular are overdiagnosed with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders and antisocial personality disorder. Mm-hmm. Women are often overdiagnosed, misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder or histrionic disorder. Our young African American males are often overdiagnosed or uh, misdiagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder di- or I conduct hate, disorder. I hate that diagnosis. Absolutely. I hate it. Absolutely. And so when you look at the experiences that these individuals come in with, they're responding to trauma. Mm-hmm. 
and the way that trauma manifests, in particular for African Americans, is that there is a level of suspiciousness and there is a level of paranoia. Um, but that comes across in assessment measures as psychoticism. And so when we give African American these assessments that were developed for white people by white people and for the white experience, it makes African Americans look psychotic right. and outside of the reality. Right. But the reality is, is that people are responding to trauma, mm-hmm. race related mm-hmm. trauma, mm-hmm. um, community violence, Mm -hmm. like all types of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so if you just talk Mm -hmm. and ask about the African-American experience, I think it's very clear that it's Mm trauma-related. There are plenty of times where I'm doing evaluations and I'm a second opinion and I am arguing as to why this is an antisocial personality disorder or this is not schizophrenia. I have to make a case and argue why is PTSD instead? And part of the challenge is trauma, certain traumas are not considered a criterion A per the diagnostical manual that we're all trained to give diagnoses on. So racism and, and things that we experience on a regular basis that is traumatizing, it's not captured, yeah. which is why the DSM does not capture the cultural experiences of, of African Americans in particular. So time out. So even even the DSM five, mm-hmm. which is the the Bible for mental health, yes. even that lacks cultural competency. Absolutely. <laughs> so again, the Bible for being able to diagnose people with mental health dis- uh, diagnosis mm-hmm. is cultural in- incompetent. Yes. Absolutely. So it's, it's at a disadvantage from the from the rip everywhere. Absolutely. Now, here's what I will say, because the argument would be is that, no, 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 no. The DSM-5 includes a cultural formulization interview okay. where you should be asking cultural questions. So in other words, if you're trained in cultural competency and you are cultural competent yourself, then you'll be able to provide cultural-based services, if I'm understanding you correctly. So they have this culturally based interview included in the DSM five. Okay. But here's where it's where it gets interesting. Uh huh. The interview is in the back of the book, <laughs> like an appendix, uh-huh. where most clinicians and providers are not doing that. When you are in the hustle and bustle of trying to get a diagnosis that's time limited, you go straight to the chapter that you are socialized to believe is fitting of this individual in front of you because of what they're presenting with. That you have been taught in school to go to. Absolutely. No one is using it. So not only is it in the back of the book, that's my first critique of it. My second critique of it is it doesn't really capture the lived experiences Mm. of the community. It talks specifically about like language barriers and delays. It's it's not necessarily fitting of the African-American experience. Right, right. So although there's attempts to be more inclusive and in including culture, because the field does recognize that it hasn't been culturally sensitive, so there's a culturally um, competency movement, but it's significantly limited as it relates to what should be considered, how it should be considered, and for who, by who, and when. And those dilemmas is why we can't move the needle. So I would imagine when you are in these situations where you are advocating for a lesser diagnosis or a different diagnosis people are bucking at that people are trying to tell you no this is I'm, I'm sure they're giving you a hard time on on that as well does that often or happen often yeah I've had some pretty horrific um, experiences and so I just I have to share this case because mm-hmm. it is mind-blowing um, the other thing is what you don't see. So I talked about the diagnosis that we often see, but we are also underdiagnosed. Mm. So this one case in particular, African Americans are most likely undiagnosed for diagnoses like autism spectrum disorder. Like I see it a lot. Now, I received a second opinion where I was going to evaluate a gentleman. He was 19 at the time, um, and he was charged with sexual misconduct he's 19 and he was facing 25 years to Mm. life Mm. in prison Mm. okay so he was evaluated by a clinic and they determined that he was antisocial personality disorder right never doesn't have a background 
in the legal system. This was his first. Oh, no record at all. This is first no offense. record at all. First offense, and he's already labeled with antisocial personality disorder before even being convicted. So his parents fight, and they ask for a second opinion. So he comes over to our agency, and so um, I take the case and I evaluate him. Now here's what's interesting: at face value, on site, it's very clear that this young man is significantly delayed. Like it's very clear. And when I started to interview him, it became more pronounced how delayed he was mm. to the degree that I had to, not, now he's 19, but because he's so delayed, I need to interview mom. So mom comes in and they give me all the details of the case and then all the background. Unfortunately, in this particular case, this young man I diagnosed him with autism spectrum disorder um, and IDD, which is intellectual developmental disorder, mild, which is the new term for MRDD, okay? Mm -hmm. That's, those are his diagnoses. He had never received these diagnoses. This is where it became problematic because per the DSM-5, he had to receive that before 18. Mm. So here's a psychologist saying, he has autism and IDD mild. The challenge is, how do you diagnose that at 19? Well, I'll tell you how. Because he should have been diagnosed at age three right, right. when these different behaviors were happening. Now, right. he did have an IEP, and he was in special ed. But in it was school. for ADHD, which is something else that is overly diagnosed with African Americans. He's not ADHD. He's IDD, and he's autistic. Mm. Now, so my report gets into court. So then they had to get a third evaluation and it was, you know, argued by everyone involved that my report was the most thorough, meaning I did the most evaluations. Um, I had the most data and evidence to support my diagnoses. Now, at the end of it, they did everything they could to not allow my evaluation into evidence mm. because had my evaluation got into evidence, <laughs> the case would have been over with. Right, right. Like even the inappropriateness of law enforcement and mm. how he was charged, everything would have been in question had my report been introduced into evidence. So they did. Um, so what ends up happening is the parents ended up taking a plea bargain and he ended up getting 18 months versus 25 years. So Still in jail family, or was it, did he get probation? In jail, in, in jail? prison. So the parents were relieved because they were so afraid. Um, but I was devastated. They were they were relieved of him getting the 18 months instead of getting the Absolutely, 20 plus. Absolutely, because they're that. hanging 25 years. Mom had to fire attorneys. The attorneys was completely racist, mm -hmm. did not want to talk to me. He hung up on me. Mm. Um, like It was just awful. So she had to fire that attorney get a different attorney and so the point is is that we don't even receive the diagnoses and resources earlier on because of the system and how the school districts are you know functioning and labeling kids mm -hmm. and so not only are we over diagnosed with things there are a lot of things too that we are um, undiagnosed with mm -hmm. that has implications for when we're older and things happen, and now we're involved in the legal system. Mm -hmm. I can tell you multiple cases where I'm sitting in front of an African-American male who should have been diagnosed with a developmental disorder, but now he's being diagnosed with a psychotic disorder that has you know, all kinds of implications in terms of how the court want to handle and manage that. <laughs> that is crazy. Mm -hmm. so, they, so they did not allow your report to get in? No. Are people ever ballsy enough to like come to you and say, "Hey, we're not gonna do this," or they do it like behind closed doors? To oh no, just... it goes down. Really? <laughs> yes. I mean, we were fighting, fight, and so you know, and what ends up happening is, so the black psychologists take the stand, and so then my credibility is attacked, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now I'm having to deal with my credentials and mm -hmm. where was my training mm -hmm. and where was my supervision mm -hmm. um, when in fact the other reports had students bachelor's oh, level terrible. master's level students yeah. um, signing off and, mm -hmm. and doing one interview right we do a much thorough evaluation because we understand context and the, the um, challenges with not considering a holistic picture because that will lend itself to an unfavorable diagnosis do you I, this is a random question, but I, I 
I often have this conversation, you know, um, with my wife, Sierra, and I'm just curious to know, like, when we look at oppression, like, it's rooted in different systems, whether mm -hmm. that's education, housing, um, give me some more, it's in a bunch of different in a bunch of different things yeah legal it's in every system. criminal justice medical medical um e everything everything right? mm -hmm. what do, do you think that there is um one that's more more evil than the other one or you know more worse than the other and i'll and i'll, and I'll tell you why i asked that question mm -hmm. is because i am and granted i may be biased to an extent because i work primarily in schools mm -hmm. um i am of the belief that the education system is probably the worst absolutely because it is so education is very much um it's an overt system mm -hmm. you know it's very much like it's so many smoke and mirrors mm -hmm. and there's so much like prominence connected to education mm -hmm. and for black people specifically we were denied education for so long mm -hmm. that you know when we were often given, you know, the ability to be educated, we'd be just taking it to get it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but what the things that I see on a day to day basis mm -hmm. with those teachers, the terrible relationships that they form with the teachers, the the two fucks that they could give about the kids, mm -hmm. their parents, you know, mm -hmm. the lack thereof of the leadership and just the overall structure of the school. Mm -hmm. I think the education system may be the worst when you start talking about like its overall effects in in oppression Absolutely. Um, what are your thoughts on on that and just is there anyone that's that's the worst of, of them all I, I would agree with you i think it i think the education system sets the foundation right a, a couple different ways um when you think about what our kids are being taught um about our our history that in and of itself and this is what we don't really talk about the psychological impact of just hearing that we are just descendants of slaves, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That messes with our self-efficacy, our ability to like perform or excel or to be motivated to even consider college and things like that. So from that perspective, just in terms of what is being educated, mm -hmm. it's very oppressive. Um, in terms of how the kids are being labeled, um, again, there's laws that have been put in place because kids were being tested and overpopulated into special ed. Like that's where African Americans are at. Mm -hmm. They're in special ed. Mm -hmm. And that's because of tests um, that are not culturally sensitive right. and conducive. So right. we're overpopulated in special ed. Then we have the prison of pipeline, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So they are suspending African-American kids at a higher rate, even in preschool. Mm -hmm. And what the research tells us about that is those kids more times than not are going to end up in juvenile detention and, and the adult prison system. So education sets the foundation in terms of what is teaching, mm -hmm. um, how it's diminishing um, our view of self. Um, and our purpose and our value just by the curriculum that is being taught, um, how they are responding to experiences. So kids are coming to school and unfortunately, you know, they hadn't had any food yep. or they don't have any utilities right. or, right. you know, they experience domestic violence mm -hmm. or community violence. So they may be falling asleep or they may be anxious, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, and it's reasonable, mm -hmm. but again, that gets criminalized. Mm -hmm. And so either they're suspended or, you know, these less, these unfavorable outcomes that, again, it has significant implications. So the education system sets our kids up for the legal system. And once you get to the legal system, I will argue that that's probably the next mm -hmm. most oppressive because mm -hmm. once you're in there, um, it's pretty much a wrap in yeah. terms of, you know, yeah. where you're going to be able to do moving forward. Yeah. And and, and, and tapping in on like the, the, the content, you know, that the kids are being the curriculum and things like that that they're learning in school. Man, sometimes the kids come to me and they like, man, Mr. John, we learning this over here and it's super boring. I look at them, I'm like, I feel you. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I, I can't even sit up here and justify That's right. you being bored or you, you know, justify you, you know, feeling like you don't want to be in class mm -hmm. because the stuff that they are really learning is pointless. Exactly. And I know, I know at the end of this, man, you never going to have to know anything about the Pythagorean theory, theorem ever <laughs> in your life, bro. Ever. That's right. You never... And you never show up again. More, more times than not, you never going to have to understand 
uh, the definition of pie. You're never going to have to use any of that stuff in school. So to see a fourth grader get so stressed out about these things early on, be anxious about that. The schoolwork, not to mention, again, like you said, the domestic violence that they're experiencing at home, the mm -hmm. trauma that they're experiencing mm -hmm. before they even get there. You telling me I got to learn about some stuff that don't even matter? Yes. <laughs> you, yes. you know what I'm saying? So when I yes. when I see that, I'm like, man, the education system is is awful. It is awful. And, you know, even when I think about my own children, you know, we had a, a horrific experience um, in one of the suburban districts that my son attended. He was in fourth grade, and I tell this story all the time because I was just flabbergasted. But my son came home, and he would try to describe to me some of the, the behaviors that other kids were having in his reading group. Mm -hmm. And he would say, Mom, I know I'm not the best reader, but I don't think I should be in this reading group. Mm -hmm. I'm like, son, well, what do you mean? And so he would start to kind of mimic like kids stuttering, like having you know speech impediments or delays or whatnot. And I said, okay. So I followed up with the teacher and she she calls me and we're having a phone conversation and oh and i noticed he was bringing home <clears throat> books in fourth grade there were like sight words mm -hmm. like why are you bringing home books for first graders mm -hmm. these were the books that he's reading in his group and he said he was like i'm not able to get the fourth grade reading curriculum okay so i follow up with the teacher she calls me and not only that she called me, but we had a conversation, and then I go and meet with her. This teacher told me that she is not giving my son and some other kids the fourth grade reading curriculum because she doesn't want them to become a behavior problem. Mm. So I said, and that's based on what? Because he is a behavior problem? Because I haven't received one phone call, one note home, one email that my son is a behavior problem. So what behavior problem are you referring to? She said, oh, no, no. I do it to prevent them from becoming a behavior problem because in my experience, when kids don't understand the reading assignment, they become a behavior problem. Mm. My response to her is, oh, so you are oppressing African-American kids from reading because you think they are going to become a behavior problem. Mm -hmm. She said yes. And she quoted the research, Ooh. right? Ooh, she said, yeah. She said, <laughs> yeah. She said, because the research shows this. I said, well, tell me what does the research say about African-American boys in the learning environment? So she looked at me. I said, that's OK. I'll tell you what it says. So I give her the research about African-American boys in the learning environment. And she said, well, I hear what you're saying, but in my class, I'm not giving him the reading curriculum. I said, you will send his reading curriculum home with him today or else we will have a major problem. So I leave. I come back. I pick my son up. It was so funny because I'm driving. He's in the back seat. And he says, Ma. <laughs> Did you fuss out Mrs. Moore today? And I smiled and I, I said, I absolutely did. Do you want to know why? Because it's also important for him to understand what yeah. was happening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he was so happy. Mom, I got my fourth grade reading curriculum. Did you fuss out Mrs. Moore? I absolutely did. Do you want to know why, son? That's racism. And here's how racism play out. And you don't ever allow somebody to tell you that you can't have something or mm -hmm. that you're not able to do something. Mm -hmm. So I, I um, you know, was encouraging him and happy that he came home to tell me about. Now, he doesn't know what it is, mm -hmm. but I'm now giving him the language to use mm -hmm. for when these experiences happen. But, yeah, I mean, she had the audacity. She did not back down. She went to her research right right <laughs> right um and that's her bias research <laughs> her bias research mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so she and, and come to find out other parents were having the same complaint mm. but again that's in the school system right so if you're telling black boys that they can't read right what are they gonna do right they're so, gonna believe you <laughs> they're gonna believe you yeah, they're gonna believe you they're gonna believe you and then, you know, they're going to do some other things that's going to have significant implications about their life trajectory. And it's just, it's it's very sad. And when you bump into it, so it's one thing when I'm at work and I see it playing out, but when it hits your personal home, mm -hmm. it's a different yeah. ball game. 
So what the hell do we do, Dr. T? Do we do we homeschool our kids? And I say we, you know, specifically, obviously, black people specifically, mm-hmm. but people who are educated in these things and, you know, we want to kind of shield our children from being oppressed. I mean, obviously, we can't, you can't save them. The world is out there, you mm-hmm. know. The systems have already, you know, taken place. You know, it's already been going on for years and years and years. Um, so what do we, what what do, what do you do? You know, what, what do we, what is the... The suggestions mm-hmm. that, you know, that we give to, to parents, you know, um, with sending these kids, sending our yeah. kids to these schools. To these schools, yeah. right? We have to educate our kids at home. Not homeschool, but they get educated in school, but we also have to educate them. We should set the foundation. Mm-hmm. Our kids should be in school challenging the information that they're learning, not taking it on, right. right? So when they're being told about their history or being told that this person founded this, our kids should be able to say, no, I don't think that's correct, right? But we as parents have to, number one, be involved and be knowledgeable enough um, and to be conscious enough to be able to do that. But we want our kids going to school challenging what they are learning or critically evaluating what they are learning so they don't internalize it. Mm-hmm. Because once they internalize it, then our work as parents is going to be that much more difficult. Yeah. I remember when I was like in the seventh grade, I had this white history teacher, which I never understood white men teaching history, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I never forget he was talking to us about Christopher Columbus mm-hmm. and Christopher Columbus discovered America, yada, yada, yada. And I can specifically remember raising my hand. Hey, <laughs> Christopher Columbus didn't discover no America. Right. He was like, mm-hmm. where you get, like, mm-hmm. he was, it's like he had never heard it before. Mm-hmm. And obviously in the seventh grade, I don't have all the tools that I do today to be able to right. articulate, right. you know, the invasion that, you know, Christopher That's Columbus, right. and, you know, everybody did, you That's know, with right. the natives and people who were already there. Uh, but I, all I asked him, I said, how could he discover something where somebody was already, already at? Already there. He didn't even say. He didn't even have nothing to say. He just got bright red and didn't even say nothing. He was just like, "I'm not dealing with it." You know that's what I'm saying? Right. But right then, yeah. that's when I knew that, like, okay, I'm going to make sure that if somebody's telling me something that I know is not true, mm-hmm. I'm going to say, mm-hmm. "Hey, that 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 mm-hmm. ain't it." You mm-hmm. know. Um, but see, again, everybody doesn't have that experience to be because a lot of times black kids don't know. I know I I do things. I have a book. Um, what's the name of this book? Oh, it's called Hey Black Child, and I read it with like the um, some of my third grade students who have a hard time reading. Mm-hmm. And there's one portion of the book where there's a picture of like um, it's a animated book, um, and there's a picture of like Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if it was like when he was being inaugurated or whatever. Um, and I go to this portion of the book and I ask the kids, I'm like, you know who this is? Mm-hmm. They be like. Dr. Martin Luther King. Everything. Everybody is Dr. Martin Luther King. Exactly. <laughs> every every prominent mm-hmm. black person that you know is Dr. Martin Luther King. Right. And that's mm-hmm. and to me that is so crazy because again, these are kids who for real, I mean, besides the last two years, all they really knew mm-hmm. was Obama being in office. And the fact that they don't even know that it lets you know what they're really being educated Absolutely. on, you know, not just in school, but obviously at home as well. Mm-hmm. So again, just really understanding the importance of, like you said, setting the foundation mm-hmm. at home, mm-hmm. you know, really being able to educate mm-hmm. your kids at mm-hmm. home, um, mm-hmm. give them the tools to be able to That's right. advocate and, you know, and touch on things, you know, when, they, when they're in these classrooms, because the school system is treacherous mm-hmm. and it will wrap you up. Mm-hmm. And specifically for like, you know, when we're just trying to survive, black boys being athletes, That's you know, right. a lot of times like we ain't even talk about, you know, the oppression that really goes on the higher education with athletes mm-hmm. and you know and, th- and things like that and mm-hmm. we seeing a little bit of shift with you know um the ncaa changing mm-hmm. a little bit of rules to kind of like switch up some stuff but even that is bs you know mm-hmm. that's that's smoking mirrors to an extent because they still gonna figure out a way to eat you know eat, eat, eat off right. of that that's um, right so that in itself like i said it's just I, I would agree with you that you know the education system is is probably the worst mm-hmm. um and again, to see it play out every day is traumatizing. Mm-hmm. Um, we touched on that word a few times, uh, trauma and traumatizing. Mm-hmm. Can you speak to, because I recently just learned um, how trauma really shows itself and like the differences between trauma, I guess what it is. And one thing that I learned was 
trauma is not necessarily the act, but it's the response that you feel, That's you right. know, um, to to the act. Mm-hmm. And what that showed me was, and what that told me was, okay, anything can be traumatizing depending mm-hmm. on, you know, the type of person who it, who it is. So can you kind of speak That's to right. like trauma specifically and whether that's small trauma, big trauma, because Sierra always talks about the little T's, the big T's, and whatnot. So can you touch yes. on a little, a little bit of that for me? Yes. And, and yes, you're absolutely correct. Trauma is based on how we respond to certain events. And, you know, unfortunately, to feel like to limit that to, like, natural disasters or, you know, car accidents or near-death experiences. Mm-hmm. Um but anytime that you are fearful of something happening because you witnessed or heard about or observed or directly experienced something yourself, that's considered trauma. So time. So that can be the first. As soon as I hear that, mm-hmm. the first thing that I come, come to my mind that I think about is parents arguing at home. Oh, yeah. Or being yelled at by your, your parent at home. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing that I automatically think about because, you know, kids, kids do fear their parents in a way. And when a, when a parent is screaming at your kid, downgrading your kid, the parents are arguing every day, constantly at home, that in itself. That's trauma. That's trauma. Yes. And unfortunately, we don't capture that enough as trauma. Mm. It becomes behavior oriented Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when we focus on the behavior then that decides what we do about it which is why it continues and i would argue it's far worse now than it has been in our history we're not capturing it you you were in the middle of saying something i think i was um saying that if we don't capture um these events as being traumatizing mm-hmm. then that in and of itself leads to you know over pathologizing misdiagnosis and not knowing what to do in response to some of the things that our people and our kids are encountering on a regular basis and for black people we see trauma all the time every day e- every day in every our, day in our homes in our neighborhoods every everywhere constant so really is the trauma is being normalized it's normalized and in fact when i i always tell my people that i'm working with like you know that's trauma and they say no that's life yeah that's regular that's regular i said it could be but it's traumatizing and this is how i know because this is how you experience in it this is why you can't sleep this is why you're hyper vigilant this is why you have headaches this is why your stomach is upset right 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 this is why you're angry or right. have aggressive thoughts right it's trauma right my uncle always says he says the dysfunction um becomes functional yep. you know the dysfunction becomes normalized mm-hmm. and again we see it every day and we just Oh, that's just what we do, or mm-hmm. you know, that's just what it is, mm-hmm. and you know, mm-hmm. and that in itself is obviously it's not good, but it creates, you know, it perpetuates the cycle and continues that's right. this, the cycle, you know, um, going on. Um, can you touch on a little bit about some of the work that you do at MBHG and like BSA, mm-hmm. um, and can you touch touch on those and break those down because I know that the that research is is yours. Like you mm-hmm. have created a lot of that research mm-hmm. um, and started and started that research. Can you touch on a little bit of that for me? Yeah. So MBHG, um, as you mentioned in my bio, I I am the clinical director, and basically what that means is I'm responsible for all the clinical services, all the direct service providers. So our therapists, our case managers, our prevention workers. Um, and I supervise clinical supervisors in terms of how they are supporting their staff. Um, I'm also responsible for the training that we do, and we do train on a very specific african center modality. Um, the theory that we use is called optimal conceptual theory, and that theory basically talks about how if we capture the oppression and the African-American experience through this lens, then we will less likely 
overdiagnosed or over pathologized and the treatment will be more um, liberating and and raising of consciousness where people can begin to heal and find peace mm. what dr myers talk about who develop optimal um, conceptual theory she says that the reason that we experience psychological distress at the rate that we do is because we have bought into eurocentrism so we have adopted eurocentric ideas Um, in terms of being materialistic, being individualistic. We have this kind of rigid way that we think is either black or white. Um, We don't necessarily believe in higher power or spirituality, and when we do, it's disjointed and segmented. Mm. Um, And so she talks about buying into how we've been socialized to believe from the dominant culture is the reason that we suffer to the degree that we do and that we have difficulty coping. So Mm. when life happens, we have difficulty coping if we're putting our faith into external material things versus our spiritual understanding of self. Mm. And so her theory basically allows us to really examine the history of people of African descent as well as um, understand that Psychological distress is a result of having a worldview that is Eurocentric, as well as living in a society that is oppressive. So when you think about being oppressed, what ends up happening is we're constantly trying to fight and survive and to find something. Mm -hmm. But we're doing that from a materialistic perspective, and that's creating more distress so we are assimilating and conforming to try to fit in to survive and that still don't work (laughs) it still doesn't work in fact it's the core root of addiction Mm. multiple addictions Mm. whether it's substance abuse whether it's gambling addiction um, whether it's shopping addiction so multiple forms of addiction is what we see as a result of us um, trying to fit this this European um, culture and value system that wasn't intended for us Um, and it's outside of who we are as natural African um, descendants like that's not how we were when you look at ancient Africa, we placed our highest value on interpersonal relationships, on being holistic and being more diunido in the way that we think and seeing challenges as an opportunity for growth and development. And so when we think about the African American experience, if we can help our people to understand that their worldview has been shaped from this Eurocentric lens, and this is the reason that they are suffering and having a difficult time coping. And what we need to do is begin to raise our level of consciousness where you can really examine your history and look at the impact of the period of enslavement on the period when the countries were colonized, if you can understand the generational trauma that comes from those errors and how it's playing out now, you are going to likely resist those Mm. behaviors. Mm. So for example, something that we see a lot in the office and in the research, things that we had to do historically to survive, we still adopt those behaviors today. We don't need those behaviors today. There are other things that we need. And for example, when you talk about our youth, when you think about the enslaved mother, in order for her to protect her children, she had to do what? Denigrate them. Mm -hmm. No, they're ugly. They're stupid. Mm -hmm. They're no good. Mm -hmm. They're worth nothing. Mm -hmm. Right? She had to do that to protect them from the slave master. Mm -hmm. We still do that currently. Right. 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 And so this is why our kids are in such a horrible position as it relates to the, their view of self and their capabilities and things that I've they gotta, can do. I've got to prepare you here because the world is not going to be nice to you outside. That's right. So another, so we call ourselves preparing them and, you know, showing them how to survive. Really, we are breaking them down and killing them spiritually, mentally, emotionally. What ends up happening is internalized racism. And I will argue tooth and nail that internalized racism, internalized oppression is what we see within our people. We can call it depression, anxiety, paranoia, schizophrenia, but ultimately it's internalized racism. What is it? Tell us what is internalized racism means we have bought into the fact that African Americans are inferior, that we are um, devalued, we are dehumanized. We're not good enough. 
Um, we're poor, we're criminals, um, we're violent, we're aggressive, we're uneducated. We have bought into that. We believe it to some degree. And that's why we can't move the needle in terms of what we need to do as a community to survive. So from this model, we are able to put into context that our history that started with enslavement is the symptom of what we see currently. And so we help our people to understand how they are internalizing the racism and oppression from years and years and years of slavery. Then we have the Jim Crow era. Then we have mass incarceration. Um, then we have, you know, the war on drugs. We it have just evolved and just, yeah. Mm -hmm. You pick the era. Mm -hmm. The psychological impact on individuals, families, and the community is internalized racism. Mm. And so this model allows us to really look at that and, and see that as the root cause in which we can then do interventions, which predates enslavement. So mm. what was life like prior to, mm. right? Where did we place our highest value? Um, what was important to us? How are we surviving? What were our accomplishments? And then that's that's where we go back to, to find how to resist it. Yeah. We were highly spiritual back then, right? So tapping back into spirituality and faith um, is a critical element of the theory. From her theory, there is a therapeutic intervention that we use called belief systems analysis. And that, in fact, help us to move people from a lower level of a consciousness. Lower level of consciousness basically means that you are assimilated into the dominant culture. You have bought into white Eurocentric ideas and values. That is the reason why you are suffering. There is tons of research, might I add, that says that individuals who are of African descent, who endorse a worldview that's more Eurocentric, experience higher degrees of depression and anxiety. And when they do experience it, they have difficulty with coping. And individuals who endorse a more African-centered worldview are less likely to experience depression and anxiety. And when they do, they have more effective coping mechanisms. Like that's what the research tells us. And so belief system analysis actually provides the intervention to allow individuals to examine their current worldview and how it's planned out and the consequences of that. And then they are actually able to begin to um, critically evaluate or learn more about what it means to be African-centered and apply some of those values. And once they start to um, experience it and apply it, they feel the liberation yeah. internally and then they can decide to make the choice to begin to resist some of the oppression that we see. Yeah. So that's the motto um, that we train on and we're doing the research on um, at MBHG, but it's on Dr. Meyer's optimal theory. And again, we use it because it's the only framework that I'm aware of. And that's in the research that really looks at oppression and historical injuries on the African-American community. So when you're talking about having a model that's culturally specific and sensitive to the experiences that we have, it captures it in a nutshell. And the individuals who we see, um, I will argue 99.9% um, .9 of them are healing. Mm. We don't have an issue with African Americans not coming to therapy, right? So right. I, I, I um, cited earlier that the research would say African Americans are less likely to come, and when they come, they terminate prematurely. The average stay of our clients is three years, <laughs> right? All African American agency, 98% African American clientele. Uh, we have a waiting list. Mm -hmm. We have over 600 active clients and a waiting list. Mm -hmm. So that research isn't really accurate. If you have conscious, culturally specific, culturally sensitive individuals providing services that's going to align itself with the experiences of the community. So MBSG is really like breaking down all type of barriers and like being super disruptive, you know, because it's <laughs> yes. like not just and not just from like a clinical like everyday standpoint, but yeah. from like a research and in informative standpoint, like people are this is going to shift entire narratives really for ye for years to come. Yeah. So let me tell you how <laughs> how the field is responding, which is interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, MBHG and the work of Dr. Myers, um, 
is also grounded in the Association of Black Psychologists, um, which started in the 60s in response to the civil rights movement. So black psychologists got together and said, you know, we need to develop our own theories that's going to fit how we understand our experiences and that's going to have treatments that's going to be um, conducive and more effective for our people. And so um, MBHG is a part of that. So we're doing a lot of work at the national level in terms of putting that um, information out there. Recently, I've been put into um, a leadership position within the association, and I've already had to respond mm. to um, an, an alliance. <laughs> There's an alliance that is now saying that um, the Alliance for Psychological Association, they are putting out information and commercials that says they want individuals to come to therapy and say, are you using evidence-based practice hmm. and if you're not using an evidence-based practice then that means that you're not receiving effective service hmm. now what we do is consider research-based it's not evidence -based. it's not evidence-based and it's not evidence-based because in order to become evidence-based you have to reduce it to a clinical trial to a structural manual mm -hmm. where um, it's controlled mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of what happens mm -hmm. um, in BSA OCT that's the opposite of what the therapy is like. It's more of a spirit-led, process-oriented process, right? And it's not time-limited. Like I said, the average stay for our clients is, is about three years. And so we would have to reduce it to like an eight-week protocol, maybe a 16-week protocol. So it was significantly limited. So we're not interested and that's in just it not, coming that's not to... how black people function. That's not how we function. Yeah. So we're not interested right. in meeting a criteria of an evidence-based practice, mm -hmm. right? But we are making headway. And so the response from the field is, well, if your therapy and your, your therapist isn't using an evidence-based practice, then they're not really effective. So I had to respond to that um, on behalf of the Association of Black Psychologists. And my response said that it's not evidence-based, it's research-based, right? You have to be inclusive of research-based um, therapies because if you're not then that's oppression in and of itself you're basically telling African Americans that if they go and see a psychologist or a therapist who is using African centered approaches they're not effective mm. right mm -hmm. the cycle of oppression mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it continues and so that's some of the work that's happening at the national level yeah again that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> that is yes. that is crazy so again they're trying to tell you guys that you are not credible yeah <laughs> and and you know kill kill the credibility which ultimately will kill the entire every everything that's right so how was the collective responding because i know you said that you responded you know being in mm -hmm. the, the leadership role how is the collective of, of ab side really responding you know to, to things like that is everybody backing you is there some internal oppression of their own going on where people are reluctant mm -hmm. um you know what's what's that kind of process and oh, experience the, been, the, been maybe like? so, so i'm just the representative okay. but um so yes the, uh, i work very closely with the current president um and that was her mission like um uh, my mission under her was to be our representative mm -hmm. um, in terms of sitting at the table and making sure that we have a voice and we are providing information and consultation so that we are not further being oppressed. Yeah. So yes, and one of the reasons and purpose of ABC's existence is to be able to fight um, that and mm -hmm. to resist that and to put education and information out that's going to meet the needs of our people. Who... <laughs> Who, and I hear people ask this question all the time, just like in regular conversation when they're talking about mental health and therapy, who does the, the therapist see? You know, how does the therapist take care of themselves? Because the stuff that, <laughs> everything that you've been talking about today mm -hmm. is, is traumatizing, mm -hmm. you know, and this is heavy stuff, you know, this it's is not, heavy. this is not information that any person can just take in all day without taking care of themselves, you know, so who does the therapist see? What is... What is your outlook on therapists, you know, going to therapy? Yeah. Um, what is your own experience? And like, you know, what's your what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly support and think that there is a need for therapists to see therapists. Mm -hmm. However, the work that we're doing is limited to 
either the Association of Black Psychologists or MBHG. And when you're highly connected and involved in both of those entities, you don't have who go. do you see, yeah. right? I risk going to see someone who doesn't hold the same level of consciousness or who is not going to be able to move me or to allow me to grow. Like that's been a huge dilemma because there's been times where I needed my own therapy. And so unfortunately, I, fortunately, I use my colleagues. Yeah, and so peers. we support mm-hmm. each other mm-hmm. um, in that way. And so I, I do, I go get my fix. So I go have my um, you know therapy sessions with my colleagues or my supervisor, and, and that's how I'm able to do it. But the other piece to it is, as long as I stay true to the model, if I'm applying it and living by it, it protects me. Mm. Um, so I do that, but again, that's very difficult to do too and to hold on to when it's so much at once. So we do need those avenues. Um, going to ABCI once a year, we go and we get, you know, refreshed we get cleansed and we ready to come back and do the work but again that's once a year um we're limited we're on an island and so it's it's very difficult i think that's probably my biggest critique of doing this kind of work is once you get to a level then who do you have Mm -hmm. that's going to allow you to continue to grow and evaluate and and view yourself and where you are in your own process so it's still there's still work to be done lots of work to be done yeah Lots. What is and again I've I had this conversation with Sierra you know I asked her this almost I think I asked her this question like once a week for mm-hmm. real and she like you just asked me that last week we just talked about it but the question is <laughs> in a perfect world you know what is the way to really like attack op- oppression like what do we really do to really like um, impact it you know what do we how do we really, you know, fight it? You know, what 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 do we really do to, you know what I'm saying, to fight these forces, you know, that have been put in place for mm-hmm. years and years and years and years and mm-hmm. years? Obviously, I, I think the one of the things that, you know, we have to understand is, number one, is that we may not see the work, you know, um, and we may not see the end, end result mm-hmm. of it. You know, it's going to always be about what you do for the, the next person or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But what should we be doing to, like, to really attack it. Yes. At a very basic level that I think is realistic is the very first thing is we have to recognize it. Yeah. Part of the problem is we don't recognize it. So, and we don't understand it. And you have some people say, that's not my experience or I'm the, I don't experience racism and I don't experience <laughs> oppression, mm-hmm. right? You have to, you have people um, who don't believe that that's their experience. So I would say at a very basic level on something that's realistically achievable, Um, for the collective in our current day is to number one, we have to be aware of it Mm -hmm. because once you're aware of it, when it shows up, you're going to know what to do about it. You're either going to succumb to it or you're going to resist it. Um, The other thing that I think is huge for us to do is we have to start developing our own. We have to be in positions where we can influence policy changes and structural changes because that's the thing. I think at the individual level, A lot has been done, but at the structural level, very little is being done. And that's where the significant impact is. So we're always talking about it from this individualistic perspective. But at the end of the day, the insidious nature of the institutions is what's killing us. Mm -hmm. And if we don't understand it and if we're not aware of it and if we're unwilling to begin to Again, go get educated, go get that degree so you can sit in these seats Mm -hmm. so we can begin to change policy. Now, that's long term. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure how realistically achievable that will be Mm -hmm. just given the nature of the world that we live in. So at a very basic level, I just think it's important that we understand what it is. So when it shows up, we know what time it is and we know what to do about it. So number one, be aware. Mm-hmm. You know, number two, it sounds like you know, um, be educated on what it is that you're <laughs> that you're trying to fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and the third one, it sounds like you're saying, we're, you know, have your own, be an entrepreneur. You yes. know, have cooperative economics, bring your money together. You Absolutely. know, Absolutely. Um, support black businesses. Absolutely. You know, support black healthcare providers. Absolutely. Um, That's it. Okay. And what about on the 
the structure level, the uh, the macro level. Mm -hmm. what, what do we what do we do? You know, from that or with that. So, you know, I think I think classism is probably the most significant thing mm. that often goes unaddressed. Mm. So I'm sitting here, I'm talking about racism and I'm talking about oppression in general. Oppression deals with any of those isms that we could talk about. So if we talk about classism, here's the problem. We are stratified in these different categories. And so lower socioeconomic status um, individuals when we have African Americans who are of higher class, middle class, they don't see the same challenges and struggles mm. as lower class. Mm. And the reason that that's important because people in the lower class are not voting. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The people out in the community trying to survive are not the ones that's voting. Right. The ones that are voting <clears throat> are the ones who are benefiting from some of these systems and oppressive practices. And so it's less likely that we are being unified in a collective effort to make change in that area. And so I think that's a huge barrier that we don't talk about enough, but we have to become, we have to position ourselves to be in these key positions. It's very similar to what I'm, I'm talking about as it relates to my own trajectory. And you say, you don't regret, um, no, because I am sitting in a seat where I can influence change as it relates to how my people are being treated and viewed in the legal system as it relates to their mental health, right? And we have to be in positions like that. Other than that, we are going to continue to fall victim to white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. that's just what it is. Mm -hmm. So the reason that it's important to be aware and to be educated and you know to support and develop our own businesses and et cetera, because when we don't, then we risk internalized oppression, mm. which is the state of the community mm -hmm. and why it's so dysfunctional and so chaotic and so violent and so impoverished. Yeah. Can can black people be racist? <laughs> I really I by, really want to know that. So by definition of the word. Uh -huh. Break it down. By Break it down. <laughs> We don't have the power and control Absolutely. to be racist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. By definition, no. Racism is socially constructed. And it's socially constructed by enslavement, by Jim Crow, by the different laws and things that we have going yes, on. Yes, right? Yes. No. You need the infrastructure to be able to carry out what it is that you are. You got to have be racist. it. Mm -hmm. Now, black people can be pre encountered. Mm -hmm. Which means that in terms of their racial identity development, they don't necessarily identify with the black experience um, or they could identify with the black experience and just, you know, be very aware or very cautious about um, white people and white supremacy. So given where we are in terms of our, our racial identity development, we might have a particular response to how we respond to events or to white people in general, but it doesn't rise to the level of racism by definition. Mm. Mm. I love that. Yeah, I, I love that. I've been called racist plenty of times by <laughs> you know some of my homeboys who don't who just don't know no better. And I mm -hmm. told them specifically what you said by definition: black people cannot be racist. Mm -hmm. We don't have any type of infrastructures and systems to be able to back out these feelings and emotions that you know That's right. that, that that we we are not in position to make others feel inferior mm -hmm. or to have less advantages mm -hmm. than we have. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Listen, Dr. T, thank you so much, no you know, you know, for coming in and forming us and, you know, informing people. You know, I think that number one again that mental health is very much important. Mm -hmm. But mental health specifically how it affects black people. You mm -hmm. know, we need to continue to push that message um and continue to push out, you know, platforms such as these where we can highlight people like yourself mm -hmm. to be able to talk about these things so i really appreciate you um before we get out of here i have like a couple like rapid questions that i want to ask you first <laughs> okay. um the first question i want to ask you is again the name of the po podcast is called the live your purpose podcast what do you consider to be living living your purpose not necessarily what is living your purpose um for yourself but what do you consider if somebody said what is living your purpose what does that mean what does mm -hmm. that mean to you living your purpose means when you are interacting with people, 
when you are, you know, just existing, when you feel the passion, when you feel the joy, when you have this experience that's indescribable um, and you just feel in purpose. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, you know, a relationship or a career or, you know, a project, whatever it is, if it's indescribable and it just connects with your spirit that is moving you. And at the end of the day, you feel rewarded regardless of, you know, external or material things. That's how you know you're living in your purpose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. If you could call your twenty-year-old self today, what would you tell that? What would you tell yourself at twenty? At twenty? Yeah. <laughs> you know, at twenty, I was actually going through my own rites of passage. Okay, all right. Um, experience. Um, but if I could tell, if I could say something to myself at twenty, I would tell myself to. Uh, Believe in yourself and believe in where you're headed. Mm. That's what I would say. Okay. Do you have any favorite quotes or favorite scriptures? My favorite quote is, I am because we are, mm. and we are because I am. Ubuntu. Ubuntu. <laughs> Absolutely. It speaks to my core yeah. daily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the best advice you ever received? Um, remember who you are. Mm. I like that. Mm -hmm. On that, we gonna we gonna end it. Yeah. Um, listen, I end the I end the podcast not just with those um those rapid questions, but one of my inspirations um for doing doing this podcast um there's a guy his name is Arian Foster he used to be a professional football player mm -hmm. um and he started his own po podcast in his post you know um, NFL career mm -hmm. and one of the things that he always does to end his podcast is he has his guest lobby um to get one of his favorite people on his podcast which is Jim Carrey uh, <laughs> right <laughs> hilarious whatever uh -huh. um one thing that I always have my guests do is I have them look at the camera and lobby to get Arian Foster on the show one day so if you could Look at that camera right now. Let me double check to make sure that camera is working. This camera right here. We're okay. going to look at this camera yes. and tell Arian Foster why he needs to be on the Live Your Purpose podcast, please. Arian Foster, <laughs> I think, is extremely important and will be extremely invaluable if you were to appear on the Live Your Purpose podcast to share your story, share your experience. You have a testimony that will benefit the community and the people at large. So we will greatly appreciate if you join Mr. Morgan on Live Your Purpose podcast to share your story. Ashe. Ashe. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. We out. Another episode down. <laughs>